Trump. I'm Chris Wallace. President Trump is back in Washington after his first meeting with Vladimir Putin. What should we look for in relations between the U.S. and Russia? We look forward to a lot of very positive things happening for Russia, for the United States, and for everybody concerned. In the wake of the G20 summit, we'll discuss where things stand on Syria, Ukraine, Russian meddling in the last election, and the Trump agenda. When we sit down with White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus, it's a Fox News Sunday exclusive. Then the Senate returns from recess, still confronted with what to do about Obamacare. Is repeal and replace in trouble? We'll ask Republican Senator Dr. Bill Cassidy. Plus, as North Korea gets closer to a nuclear ICBM, President Trump reaches out again to Chinese President Xi. I'm sure that whether it's on trade or whether it's on North Korea, we will come to a successful conclusion. We'll ask our Sunday panel if there's any way to stop Kim Jong-un in his tracks. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. President Trump is back at the White House after the G20 summit where he seemed to get along better with Russian President Putin than some of our longtime European allies. So where do we stand now on foreign hotspots, trade, and climate change? And what about a newly disclosed meeting in 2016 between the president's son, Trump campaign officials, and a Russian lawyer? In a few minutes, we'll break it all down with an exclusive interview with the White House Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus. But first, let's bring in correspondent Kevin Cork at the White House with the latest. Kevin. Chris, no matter how far away the president travels from Washington, for example, the 4,000 miles to Hamburg, Germany, this White House is never terribly far away from the Russian meddling story. It was one of the topics heading into the G20, and it is again coming out of the G20. The president talking about it and tweeting about it once again, this time talking about his meeting with President Vladimir Putin, he tweeted, I strongly pressed President Putin twice about Russian meddling in our election. He vehemently denied it. I've already given my opinion. Later, the president tweeting on Sunday, Putin and I discussed forming an impenetrable cybersecurity unit so that election hacking and many other negative things will be guarded. This, as Fox News confirms, that Donald Trump Jr. arranged a meeting at Trump Tower during the campaign with a Russian lawyer with connections to the Kremlin. That meeting he failed to disclose on his federal paperwork, but had been noted by other attendees, including Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort. We also heard from the Trump legal team that the person who took part in that meeting may have misrepresented herself and who she worked for and may, in fact, have had, had ties with DNC operatives. Very interesting twist in that story. As for deliverables from the G20 summit, no surprise the Syrian ceasefire is an obvious one. The president tweeting, now's the time to move forward in working constructively with Russia on that. Another deliverable, the announced agreement with China to conduct joint military exercises in 2018, Beijing's obvious attempt to mollify U.S. concerns over the North. On trade and the final communique, which acknowledged America's right to seek more trade equity abroad, uh, Mr. Trump tweeted this Sunday, the G20 summit, a great success for the U.S., explained that the U.S. must fix the many bad trade deals it has made, will get done. And the summation also noted America's decision to back out of the Paris Climate Accord, which it called irreversible. Of course, according to the White House, it's non-binding, and we're out. Chris? Kevin Cork reporting from the White House. Kevin, thanks for that. Joining me now, President Trump's chief of staff, Reince Priebus, Reince Welcome back to Fox News Sunday. I'm happy to be here, Chris. Great. Let's start with the breaking news that in June of 2016, there was a previously undisclosed meeting. And let's put up all the players on the screen. Donald Trump Jr., this was during the campaign. Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and a senior advisor. And then campaign chairman Paul Manafort met a Trump Tower with a Russian lawyer with ties to the Kremlin, Natalia Veselnitskaya. Why did they meet, and why are we just learning about it? Well, first of all, Chris, I don't know much about it, other than what I've communicated with various members there on the screen. Uh, it was a very short meeting. It was a meeting, apparently, about Russian adoption. Uh, and after about 20 minutes, the meeting ended, and that was the end of it. And as far as non-disclosure, look, Jared Kushner uh, put in his disclosure a little prematurely. He's since amended it. All of that is disclosed. And it was a nothing meeting. And now, what's developing from that meeting, if you look at the uh, article that Circa put out, 
uh, is that the individual that set up the meeting may have been affiliated with Fusion GPS, which is an opposition research firm that is being uh, subpoenaed and talked to by the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, about their role in putting together that phony dossier that people know about in regard to the president. So this is a developing story. I don't know much about it other than it seems to be on the end of the Trump individual. It's a big nothing burger, but may spin out of control for the DNC and the Democrats. Well, let, let me ask you about two aspects of that. In, in terms of the DNC, are you suggesting that this was somehow a setup by Democrats to, to try to link them or compromise them with the Russians? And, and this was before there was any Russian interference in the election. So why would they have done that? I have, well, look, wh why was Fusion GPS involved in putting together this dossier? I don't know, Chris. And I don't think too many people know uh, why or how this meeting came about. However, what I can tell you is from all my communication with our team on this subject, there was nothing to it. It was a 20-minute meeting. It ended after everyone was decidedly uh, sitting there saying there's nothing happening here. They moved on. Uh, and I think in the end, what you're going to find in this story, if you read the Circa column, is I think there's more questions on the Democrat side than anywhere else. And, and one last question about the meeting. Why would Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and campaign chairman Paul Manafort all want to meet with a Russian lawyer about Russian adoption? Listen, I, I have no idea, Chris. You're going to have to talk to, to them. However, you know, talking about issues of foreign policy, issues related to our place in the world, issues important to the American people like adoption is something that's not unusual. So when you go through a campaign, you're not just talking to one particular group of people about, in this case, adoptions in Russia. You have policy teams talking about our place in Asia, talking about trade in China. You have policy teams so that, this was, that run the gamut. So this so was a foreign policy unusual. meeting? Apparently so. Okay. I want to clear up, speaking of foreign policy meetings, what really happened in the Putin-Trump summit in Hamburg on Friday. Uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov says that after Putin denied meddling in the election, he, Trump, this is his quote, said that he accepts these assertions and that President Trump said, this is Lavrov quoting Trump, certain circles in the U.S. are still exaggerating, although they cannot prove this, the topic of Russia's interference with the U.S. election. Reince, is that true? Did the president say what Lavrov says he said? No, it's not true. The president, the president absolutely did not believe uh, the denial of, of President Putin. What the president did is he immediately came into the meeting, talked about Russian meddling in the U.S. election, went after that issue at least two separate times. This was not just a five-minute piece of the conversation. This was an extensive portion of the meeting. And after going at it with President Putin more than once, two times, maybe even three times, the president... At that point, after spending a large part of the meeting on the subject, moved on to other topics. So, so to be clear, like Syria does not and ISIS and the And we're going to get to that. He does not accept Putin's denial. He believes the Russians meddled. He's, he's answered this question many times. He said they probably meddled in the election. They did meddle in the election. The one thing that he also says, which drives the media crazy, but it's an absolute fact, is that others have as well. And that's true. China has, North Korea has, and they have consistently over many, many years. So, yes, he believes that Russia probably committed all of these acts that we've been told of, but he also believes that other countries also okay. participate. Okay, Let, let's, in let's this move activity. to the next subject, which is what is the response? What are the consequences for doing that? And I want to put up a tweet that <laughs> your president, your boss, has been very busy on Twitter today. I want to put up this tweet. Now it is time to move forward in working constructively with Russia. Does that mean that they're off the hook as far as Russian meddling is concerned? No, it doesn't mean they're off the hook. But what it means is, is that we're not going to forego progress simply because we have a disagreement in regard to this uh, meddling in the United States election. What it means is that we need to move forward with things like a ceasefire in Syria, which is going to save a lot of lives, which we're doing uh, I think starting today in yes. southwestern Syria. It means we need to move forward with working together uh, with ISIS. We need to move forward 
with working together and resolving the conflict in Ukraine. So how do you? So respond? you can have you can chew gum. I walk and chew gum at the same time, Chris. How do you respond to Democrats like Chuck Schumer who are saying it's disgraceful that the president comes out of this meeting and basically says, "Oh, we're going to move forward." Right. Well, we could we could solve world peace and world famine, and I think Senator Schumer would say the same thing. So look, they're they're programmatic when it comes to trashing the president. When you look at what President Trump did in Europe and recommitting ourselves to our NATO allies, committing ourselves to our partners in Europe, our partners across the the world, uh, committing ourselves to the, to the values of the West, uh, delivering a speech in Poland, which many people said are the best speeches since Ronald Reagan. If you look at what he did uh, in Hamburg, I mean, other than our small disagreements on trade and the, and, and the Paris Agreement, we have unification with our allies. All right. Well, I want to get to that with you. But let's talk about one more aspect of the trump Putin meeting, and that is progress on Syria. Uh, they did discuss it. Here is how Secretary of State Tillerson described it afterwards. I would tell you that, by and large, our objectives are exactly the same. Maybe they've got the right approach and we've got the wrong approach. I want to ask you about that. The Secretary of State says the U.S. and Russia have exactly the same objectives and that maybe they have the right approach and we have the wrong approach. Russia, Putin, are backing Assad, who has slaughtered hundreds of thousands of civilians, and they may have the right approach? Well, look, I, I think what he may have been referring to is the fact that Barack Obama put a red line uh, in the sand and didn't actually follow through with the threat that he made in Syria. And we find ourselves, from, we find ourselves behind the eight ball in Syria because nothing happened for many, many years, and now we're look, from the outside looking in. That all being said, we need to move forward and actually maybe work with Russia on bringing peace to Syria. And I think that's what you're seeing the beginning stages of happening. But they want... Assad. They want somebody who, the butcher of Baghdad, who is slaughtering hundreds of thousands well, of people. Well, maybe not long term. I think it's yet to be seen what is going to be of uh, Assad. I mean, certainly he's a butcher and he's a bad person. And you've seen President Trump act decisively when it comes to Syria. It didn't take him long to pull the trigger uh, in regard to uh, a response to the chemical attack. That's a decisive leader. And that's who the, the, the G20 leaders saw in Hamburg, as someone who's decisive, someone who's not afraid, someone who doesn't kowtow and, and stands up for himself when it comes to issues of disagreement, like trade and the Paris Agreement. Let's, let's talk about exactly that subject. Uh, because generally, at these G20 summits, the meetings of the world's leading economies, East and West, uh, the U.S. sets the tone. But there were a lot of times, and you, you've just referred to it a couple of times, sharp disagreement over climate change, just completely uh, disagree. And, and they kind of papered over the disagreement on trade, which still is there. Does the president have any trouble when it's, he's won against 19? No, actually, I think the American people should look at that as a massive positive about this president, that you have a president that doesn't just show up at the G20 and sink into his chair and just suddenly agree with all of these European leaders across the, uh, across the table when it comes to issues that he disagrees on. The president's made it very clear that he doesn't believe the Paris Agreement is fair. Now, you say it's a disagreement. It's really not a disagreement on the environment. It's a disagreement on the Paris uh, Agreement itself and the fact that we don't want to be uh, hamstrung by an agreement that's going to hurt the American worker across the country that the president's pledged to support. We, don't, we, we disagree in regard to trade a little bit and the fact that this president actually believes that, that trade should be fair, that we shouldn't be taken advantage of. I mean, that's something the president's standing up for the American people. That should be seen a, as a positive, Chris. Let me ask you a specific question on trade because the president may decide in the next few days whether or not to impose those tough restrictions on steel imports coming into this country. Talk about a possible 25 percent tariff. Uh, the head of the European Commission says we are prepared to take up arms if need be. His reaction to the fact that the president may do this. Is President Trump ready for an international trade war? Well, OK, first of all, the president does what he says he's going to do. He's been talking about steel, aluminum, cars for 30 years, my entire, practically my entire life. He is, he believes in the things that he believes in. There's also a national security piece to this, and American people need to understand. If a country loses its ability to produce steel, it loses something in regard to national security. A country cannot find itself importing steel from China, 
subjected to dumping of steel from other countries so, uh, and, I, and, and, and decreasing I don't mean to interrupt, but, but, but this is an important issue, not just for trade, not just for the American I, worker, but for national security. But you're making the argument that, yes, he's going to impose tough restrictions I'm, on steel imports. My guess is, is that he will, because he promised that he would. But then, my, but then the Europeans are going to impose tough restrictions. Of course, because, well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But well, they've they been say taking they will. advantage of the United States. Many of these countries have been taking advantage of the United States. And part of the reason why President Trump is in the White House is because he told the American people that it's, it's, the time is over for the rest of the world to take advantage of the United States. Now, that'll but be what happens said, when they impo- what happens when they impose tough restrictions on our well, exports to them. It, 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 and then, and then bad, Americans Chris, lose jobs. There's, other than maybe a few countries, you can't find a trade surplus going the opposite direction from the United States. Th- that all being said, let me just, because we might be running out of time, I want to make it very clear. We are this was a time. positive meeting. The president set the stage in Europe. The, the, the leaders of the G20 came to the president. The, he, he was a star in Hamburg. And no one can take that away. And the fact of the matter is, I think he's placing America first, but with that, strategically aligning our allies and making sure that our objectives across the world and the objectives, the objectives of Western civilization are being met. One last question. I've got about a minute left for it. Okay. We're, we're over time. Senate coming back this week, going to take up health care. Mitch McConnell is acknowledging that you may not pass repeal and replace. You may have to work with the Democrats to pop, prop up Obamacare. More Republican senators coming out against it. How much trouble is repeal and replace in? I don't think it's in a, 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 a half as much trouble as the media wants it to be in, just like it wasn't the case when we went through the House uh, bill the second time around. Everyone said that it was over, and then a few days later it passed. I think that's what you're seeing right now. I think you're seeing uh, members of the Senate putting their wish list together. You have a leader in Mitch McConnell that can get it done. If anyone can get it done, Mitch McConnell, President Trump, Working together with the Senate. Yes or no? Can will they done. pass? Yes. Yes. We'll yes. Pass. They will get a. They will get a repeal and replace bill done. I believe that before the August recess. Maybe before. Maybe a little bit into it. But I know that this president expects them to get this thing done, whether it be before August recess or during August recess. The president expects the Senate to fulfill the promises it made to the American people. Reince, thank you. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Always good to talk with you. Thank you, Chris. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss President Trump's latest turn on the world stage, meeting with Vladimir Putin and other leaders. There is the position of the United States on the one hand, but I am very happy that all other G20 heads of states and government have agreed that the Paris Agreement is irreversible. German Chancellor Angela Merkel, host of the G20 summit, acknowledging there were some sharp differences between the U.S. and the other countries. And it's time now for our Sunday group, Fox News senior political analyst, Britt Hume. Columnist for The Hill, Juan Williams, former Democratic Congresswoman Donna Edwards, and former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, author of the best-selling book, Understanding Trump. Well, Speaker Gingrich... G19 was trending on Twitter uh, this weekend because of sharp differences between the president and all the other leaders, especially on climate change, but also, as you heard, my discussion with Reince Priebus on trade. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for the U.S.? I think it's a good thing. Look, the president starts from a simple premise. We have a whole series of agreements that are bad for America. Well, they're good for the guys that got the deals. So all these guys who got these good deals are going, oh, gosh, you actually want to change the agreement? Well, same thing with NATO. We went out and said to NATO, pay your fair share, including Germany, by the way. And all of a sudden, they're shocked that we want to actually have them help defend themselves. So if you're going to go in and you're serious about changing the trade deals, the other side who have had a good free ride are going to be mad at you. If you're serious about changing the Paris Accord on economic grounds, which is what Trump said, if you read his speech, it's very clear that he thinks this is a bad deal for America. Well, if you're the Germans and the Chinese and the Indians, you think it's a great deal for you. So... I think he did exactly what he promised to do. I think that's exactly what the campaign was about. If if they think they can get along without the U.S. and the Paris Accord, let's talk about it six months from now, because the truth is Angela Merkel and Germany ain't that big. And those people don't have have that much clout. And in the end, remember, he starts the week by going to Warsaw. So between Theresa May and Britain and the Polish government of Warsaw, he's also reminding the Europeans. The Europeans are split on a lot of issues. We don't happen to be with the chancellor on them. Uh, Congresswoman Edwards, let me bring you in on this, because while there certainly were differences and the European leaders 
aren't happy about this and in many cases kind of said it's one against 19. I'm sure there are a lot of Trump voters who would say playing nice with the rest of the world hasn't helped them, particularly in the case of jobs that they've lost. Well, I don't think it's a question of playing nice. It's a question of being a leader of the world. And I think that one of the perceptions coming out of the G20 is the United States doesn't seem to be standing in its leadership position. And so, you know, look, I was not a big fan of um, many of those trade deals. I think that it's really important for us to look at ways that we protect the American worker, that we strengthen our, our manufacturing uh, force. And so I think it's appropriate to look at those uh, those things. But it doesn't mean leaving the rest of the world behind. It's an interesting formulation here, and you're hearing it from Congresswoman Edwards and from many others as well, which is that if the president is out of step with the leaders in Europe, in other words, if he refuses to follow them, he is therefore not leading. To me, that just, on, on logic grounds, that doesn't make any sense. He's taken a different path. Um, there's much of the, there are many nations who will be with him. Certainly the reception he got in Warsaw indicated that as well. And because he's out of step with a certain group of European leaders does not mean that he's given up a leadership role. It may, it may indeed mean he's embracing it. But let me ask you one, and, and you know, it was a very interesting conversation uh, I had with Reince Priebus on this question of steel imports. He, he basically says he's going to impose limits on steel, and you get the head of the European Commission saying, good, we'll then impose limits on some of your exports. Right, so you get into a trade war situation. So you see that inside the White House you have people like Steve Bannon saying, yes, this will appeal to our base to people who feel that they've lost jobs because of these trade deals that are unfair to American workers. But you get then people on the National Economic Council, Gary Cohn and others saying, you know what, we don't want a trade war. We don't need that kind of static right now. The economy seems to be going along pretty well. We had good numbers this week. Uh, why would you want to disrupt that? Uh, and I think for a lot of people, this question then extends to the leadership issue you're hearing discussed here this morning. So my take on this is, when you talk about American leadership, you have to understand, we have the biggest economy in the world. We have the biggest military in the world. We can set an example for other countries. It may be that at some point you say, hey, we're taking more aggressive steps than are being imposed on other countries, so that's not fair to us, but guess what? We're the big boy. I want to turn to perhaps the highlight of the whole summit, and that was the meeting at least from the U.S. point of view, the meeting between President Trump and P President Putin. Here's the tone they set at the beginning of the meeting. We look forward to a lot of very positive things happening for Russia, for the United States, and for everybody concerned. And it's an honor to be with you. I'm delighted to be able to meet you personally, Mr. President, and I hope, as you have said, our meeting will yield positive results. Speaker Gingrich, how much should we make of what the two men said about Russian meddling? Now you've got President Trump in a tweet this morning saying, I'm going to move forward. Uh, Syria, North Korea, all the issues. How, are we overstating the importance of this meeting? Well, I think we'll know in six or eight weeks. I mean, if, if they actually have a ceasefire that actually works, which also, by the way, involves Israel and Jordan, that's the first time in, this, in the Syrian civil war that you will have actually had a joint American-Russian agreement that, st that, that survived. Uh, but I would say that you'll know more about that in six to eight weeks. If they create a relationship where they can get a genuine ceasefire in eastern Ukraine, that is an enormous step in the right direction. If they can create a relationship where the Russians understand that we would defend the three Baltic states uh, and that they cannot threaten them, that's an enormous... I mean, Yeah, Russia there are a lot of ifs there. And that's exactly right. I, I don't, given Putin's track record, I can't sit here today and tell you this is a breakthrough. I can tell you that the tone is probably right. The fact that it lasted over two hours is probably right. Uh, and that Putin is a very tough guy, but I think he may be, have been surprised by Tillerson and, and Trump because they're very tough guys. And so I think, it, it, to go back to something Brett said, if you end up with two sets of tough guys, and one of them has the largest economy, the largest military, the greatest reach in the world, probably that guy ends up winning if he's determined. And I think ultimately Putin is probably going to deal with Trump. Congresswoman Edwards, uh, you know, I want to ask you about this, this controversy, and a lot of Democrats have been hitting Trump, a lot of your former colleagues in Congress, uh, at the idea of talking about moving forward. I mean, to some degree, where, do we want to hold the entire relationship hostage? Uh, just assume the worst, that the Russians meddled like crazy, tried to do everything they could to interfere in the election. 
don't we still have to do business with them? Well, I mean, there's moving forward, and then there is, do we do sanctions relief? And I, I, I so I want to no talk about. So I want to, well, I want to hear what moving forward means because it, the fact is, the Trump administration actually has been engaged in the Congress, trying to uh, loosen uh, the the sanctions, and um, and are not happy with the bill that came out that came out of the Senate. And so I want to know what moving forward means. Does that mean that we uh, do have to have a relationship? Uh, at some level to try to deal with Syria? Yes, but our interests in Syria are very different from uh, the Trump administration interest in Syria. We're not going to prop up the Assad regime. I think it, Russia has that interest. And so, might, might I suggest that if, if, if the president had had a very tense meeting centered entirely on the alleged meddling in the election, which appears clearly to have happened, and the meeting broke up and disagreement uh, with other issues on the back burner, that the president's critics would not have liked that better than what happened. This amounts at least to a renewal of diplomacy in an atmosphere in an area where the diplomacy has been in a chill for some time. We'll see what comes of it. It's way too early to judge it, as as the speaker suggests. Um, but I can't help but think that it's probably a worth worth a try at least to see if diplomatically some things constructive things can be accomplished. All right, we have to take a break here. We'll see you all a little later. Up next, the GOP's health care agenda is in trouble, but how much trouble? We'll discuss the fate of repeal and replace with Republican Senator and Dr. Bill Cassidy, who has his own plan. At a time. A, mess. a look outside the Beltway at New Orleans' famed French Quarter. The Senate returns from recess tomorrow with Republicans still hoping to keep their promise to repeal and replace Obamacare. But how realistic is that goal? Joining me now is Louisiana Senator and Dr. Bill Cassidy, who has his own health care plan. Senator, welcome back. Thank you. You were one of the few Republican senators or congressmen to hold an open town hall during this last recess, and you got an earful on health care. Let's take a look. I'll tell you what's rude, um, kicking 22 million people off their health care in this country who you know cannot afford it. You've worked at the, at the Earl K. Long Hospital for a long time. You know what people are like at their lowest. So to step on their necks by kicking them off their health care at this point, that's cruel, sir. Um, uh, strong message to follow. Uh, as you went around the state of Louisiana these last 10 days, how concerned are voters, how concerned are folks when they read, and obviously this fellow was aware of it, of the CBO report that, that tens of millions of people could lose their health insurance under the plans Republicans are putting forward? They're very concerned. You're hearing two different arguments. You're hearing first folks saying, listen, I'm paying $1,700 a month for insurance before Obamacare is paying 800 and I have $6,000 deductibles per family member. Uh, and are you have folks who with disabilities who are concerned they will lose their coverage for the disability. That shows that health care is like no other issue. It touches people in their most personal being. We got to get it right. And they're not happy with the current situation. Well, people don't like change even from worse to better. And there's been a lot of kind of promulgation of things which are not true about the health care bills that have gone up. By the way, I have reservations about the Senate bill, but nonetheless, some of that which is of concern does not need to be of concern. Well, let's talk about the plan, because you and Senator Collins, Republican Senator Collins of Maine, who has said at this point that she's against the bill, the, the Senate bill, the, your plan that you're putting forward, and here are some of the highlights. Keep most Obamacare taxes to pay for a replacement. Allow states to keep most of Obamacare if they want for states that want a new system, auto-enroll people in insurance so they have to opt out not opt in. Senator, it's an interesting plan, but how many of your colleagues in the Senate, and particularly Republicans, have signed on to it? Uh, we have six of us total, more than any other plan out there. And by the way, I would say that is the only way we can go forward. But, but you, you need 50. Oh, we Plus the vice president. Oh, totally get that. But once, if, if the president logs in that this is the plan he wishes, or that the leadership says, okay, this is the plan we want, then there will be the plan that goes forward. Some people were going to sign on. They said, let's see what President Trump does. Let's first talk, Chris, though, about why they've had such a problem passing any plan. They're trying to combine tax reform with health care reform. We take care of that. 
we say let's do health care reform first and then address the tax situation when you do comprehensive um, uh, reconcil- uh, comprehensive tax reform. Don't mix the two. We don't mix the two. Secondly, are we serious about keeping Donald Trump's campaign pledges to cover all, care for pre-existing conditions, eliminate the individual and employer mandate, and lower premiums? If we're serious about that, Cassidy Collins is the only way to get there. But, but here's the criticism that, that you hear, and quite frankly, I, I don't mean to be negative, but this is the reason it doesn't seem like Cassidy Collins is going anywhere, is that if New York, what you're basically saying is it's a federal system, each state can decide what fits them. That is a good conservative federal argument. But if New York and if California decide that they're going to retain Obamacare with all of the benefits, most of Obamacare, with federal taxes, which is what your plan would do, conservative senators say in their states, which are going to do away with Obamacare, then the folks in their states are paying so New Yorkers can have bigger, better, richer health care coverage than they get. That is a misunderstanding of our bill. Every state gets an equivalent amount of money based upon their population and a couple other factors, cost of care, etc. So every state would get their fair share, if you will. New York and California would continue to get the share they want, minus, by the way, the penalties on the individual and employer mandates. We repeal those mandates. So those states would have to reimpose individual and employer mandates. Frankly, I don't think they keep Obamacare. I think they go with our other option. All right. The hot idea right now uh, is Ted Cruz's plan that he is being offering under which uh, <clears throat> each exchange uh, an insurer would, could offer what are called skinny plans, cheaper plans with fewer benefits that people could buy. But as long as they offer one plan that has all the benefits under Obamacare. And the argument against that is that you're going to get healthy people. They're going to buy the cheaper plans with less coverage because they're healthy. And that means that the middle income people who aren't covered by Medicaid, who have pre-existing conditions or serious problems, are going to have these expensive comprehensive plans they won't be able to afford. You basically have a two-class insurance system, and for the people who really need it, no insurance at all. Well, first, I'm all for, <clears throat> I'm all for people being able to choose the insurance plan that best suits their needs. We should absolutely do that. But you're right. If you sluice off the older and sicker in their own plan with their own risk pool, then you've just recreated the Obamacare exchanges where the federal taxpayer is putting billions in to subsidize the expense of a few. We need to have a common risk pool where everybody uh, chips in a little bit for that young person who gets in a car wreck, for example. If we do it, in that case, the Cruz Amendment's a good amendment. But as it now stands, Cruz is a non-starter for you. I don't know the amendment. I, if it turns out it's two plans... Well, that's what he's described. With No, that's okay. With two risk pools, then that's bad. Because, but that's what he's t- described. No, he has not yet designated whether or not you have a single risk pool or two risk pools. If it is a single risk pool, that actually works. If it is two risk pools, that's just Obamacare recreated. Uh, and we need to do something different than Obamacare. At least 10 Republican senators have now said, have come out formally, you have not, although you've expressed doubts about it, have expressed doubts about the McConnell plan as it was offered the last week in June. Is that plan now dead? We don't know what the plan is. Well, uh, wait a minute. It was, it was submitted. Well, the draft plan has now been serious rewrite. And so we don't know what the serious rewrite. Uh, clearly, the draft plan is dead. Is the serious rewrite plan dead? I don't know. I've not seen the serious rewrite plan. <laughs> it's, it, it's a heck of a way to do business. It is a heck of a way to do business. By the way, I go back to Cassidy Collins. Nice thing about Cassidy Collins. <laughs> the nice thing about Cassidy Collins, as you said, it's a conservative federalist approach, which actually gives the state's guidelines, gives every state their fair share, and allows them to come up with the answer for their state. It actually takes that decision making away from us, returning it to the patient and the state. That's where we should be. And then there is the idea that President Trump offered in a tweet a few days ago, and let's put this up on the screen, if Republican senators are unable to pass what they are working on now, they should immediately repeal and then replace at a later date. What do you think of that? Uh, non-starter. I'll tell you it'll be uncertainty in the insurance markets. Premiums will rise for middle class families. It gives all the power to people who actually don't believe in President Trump's campaign pledges, who actually don't want to continue to cover and care for pre-existing conditions and to lower premiums. It gives them the stronger hand. I think it's wrong. I think it betrays President Trump's campaign pledges. So I come away from this, Senator, 
thinking that, that repeal and replace is in real trouble. Uh, in the current pathway, it has been. And I know I sound like a broken record. We should go back to conservative principles where we devolve power to the states and to the patients, allowing them to make the patients the, the best decision for them. But I guess what I'm asking you is, if you look at a rewritten, and I understand you haven't seen it all, but as what you've heard about, I mean, there's nobody who's more clued in on this than you are in the Senate. If you look at what uh, McConnell is talking about, look at what Cruz is talking about, forget Kennedy, uh, Ca uh, Cassidy Collins for a moment, how much trouble is repeal and replace in? Uh, if you're only talking about the draft plan, clearly it's not going to pass. Ten senators have said they would not vote for it. On the other hand, every time they come up with an iteration that becomes more conservative in the sense of giving power back to states, we move a little bit closer to passage. So if we continue in that pathway, I do think we come up with both a bill that passes and one that fulfills President Trump's campaign plan. Does this get passed by the end of the month? I don't know that. You, you want to put odds on it? Uh, I would probably put that as 50-50. I do think we have to do something for market stabilization. Otherwise, people who are pre paying premiums of twenty, thirty, and forty thousand dollars will pay even that much more. So we have to do something to stabilize the market for those middle class families currently kind of mm, groaning beneath Obamacare. Uh, but going forward, Obamacare just cannot. Our American people want more freedom to make the decision that matters to them and not have somebody in Washington, D.C. tell them what that decision should be. Obamacare tells them what that decision should be. It may take a while, but we will get to a point where that power goes back to the family, and that's where it should be. But it might not happen on this legislative calendar. It may not happen completely on this legislative calendar, but the process will begin. And as that process begins, it will, it will be inevitable that it will eventually completely occur. Senator Cassidy, thank you. Thanks for coming in. It's always good to talk with you, sir. Thank you, Chris. Up next, we'll bring back our Sunday group to handicap whether Mitch McConnell can put together the 50 votes he needs to pass a bill. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel about GOP chances for repeal and replace? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday. And we may use your question on the air.